thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and also be honored by, by the Hooker Distinguished Professorship. Um, it gives me the chance to spend here uh, three days. I already gave a physics colloquium today and I have the great pleasure to spend the next two days talking to many of the students uh, and the faculty here at the physics department. Um, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Okay, uh, so we've got a very simple thing to do today. Uh, we're just gonna try to you know, get our minds ready to think about the universe as a whole. Um, to the, the, the study of cosmology is understanding of the evolution and sort of the history of the universe as a whole. We'll, do be, we'll be doing quite a bit of that. Um, and then just ask the very simple question. So if the universe has a finite age, we know now it's 13.7 billion years old, um, <clears throat> what is the first thing that formed in the universe? Yeah, it's sort of a, actually a totally obvious question. If it had a finite age, the universe itself wasn't even there 13.7 billion years ago, and now it's full of galaxies and us and all sorts of things. Um, totally obvious question to ask, you know, what's the first thing? Um, and that's what I'll, I'll try to do. So my outline for today is <clears throat> more for us, get us ready. So I want to talk a little bit more about where we live. And so I'm going to skip mundane things that you know very well already, like the solar system, for example. We're not even uh, going to go there. But I want to talk a little bit about our own galaxy and sort of our immediate neighborhood, sort of only the things out to a few hundred million light years. Okay. It's a very small patch of the universe. But it's special for us because we happen to sit right in the middle of it. And, <clears throat> and I'd like to share with you a little bit uh, some of the knowledge we have about that. Uh, then go on and move away from this tiny little patch uh, of our immediate neighborhood and you know, just uh, think a little bit about how telescopes are beautifully proven time machines um, where the speed of light in vacuum is a constant, is a fundamental physical constant, vacuum, any form of light, whether it's radio waves or x-rays or the visible, it'll always travel at the same speed. <coughs> and uh, the beauty of that is, well, if we just can find light that's been traveling for 12 billion years, well, we actually get to see what things looked like 12 billion years ago. And that's what we'll be doing. Um, so there's some nice proven time machines. And then I really want to uh, show you uh, just some of the uh, most exciting images that we have about what the universe looked like when it was only 400,000 years old. So that's, uh, it really was a baby back then. Uh, and so it'll be uh, just looking at our picture album, how the universe started. But that's what is going to set us up nicely, because if you do know what the universe looks like very early on, and you are a physicist that is concerned with how the laws of physics operate, how gravity makes things contract together, how fluids move, so the laws of hydrodynamics, talk a little bit about that, so how the gases that existed back then are being moved around by gravity and how they act eventually to form galaxies and stars within them. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to set up us nicely. If we know what the universe looked like, we then can apply our physical laws to predict what comes next. Okay? It's kind of like having a pendulum. If I put it here and I let go, well, with my physical knowing about the physical laws of gravity, I will know how it's going to swing and how long it's going to take to swing. We're going to attempt the same thing. Knowing the initial condition from where we start, how are we going to predict uh, what comes next? <clears throat> And I'm going to conclude the lecture with you know, just a few sort of uh, almost philosophical remarks, but um, we're trying to encourage you to really take astrophysics very, very personal. Um, uh, we'll get there when we get there. OK, let me do one thing first. Um, and perhaps we can cut the light for this one. Um, this is actually, let me go back. Can we see OK? It's, a, it's unfortunately a little dark. Uh, it's the night sky. So here, here you've got the band of the Milky Way. That's a typical winter constellation, Orion. That's Orion's belt. For the ones of you that saw Man in Black, yes, that's right. Uh, that's his belt. That's actually a sword that's hanging from it. That's his elbow, sort of the head over here. There's even a bow here. He's sort of standing there, and he's shooting some bear over here. OK. <laughs> You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, and so, you know, that's sort of the band of the Milky Way, sort of nicely, you know, if you can recognize this one, looking at this more orange star that you have here helps you actually find where the band of the Milky Way is. Now, 
this is exactly what it looks like when you uh, look at the night sky. The one thing uh, that you can't do when you just look at it on the night sky is do the following. Let's fly towards it, okay? Some of the stars now of Orion are already gone. See, the next one is disappearing here, this one disappearing there. Very, very simple lesson, right? All the constellations that you see on the night sky are pure chance projections. None of these stars, you know, most of them, are not actually physically connected at all. It's just patterns they make. Some of them are not so bright stars, but very close to us. Not very luminous stars, but very close to us. So they appear bright to us. And so these, these patterns really are not physically connected, and they just change over time. You know, in 10,000 years, many of the constellations will look quite different. Um, but some of these uh, structures are physically connected. And let's, let's fly a little more. So actually, we already flew out about uh, a few hundred light years. Okay, we took a few seconds. So I'm stretching the laws of physics a little bit. Okay, <laughs> much faster than the speed of light. Don't do this at home. It's actually very dangerous <laughs> because the light would be heavily blue shifted. So as you're flying towards it, you would have gamma rays. Anyway, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> We've got physical laws in place that don't allow you to do that either. Uh, so that's good. It's for public safety, I think. Okay, uh, let's fly towards it. <clears throat> Here's uh, Orion. That's a, a star forming region. It's actually a, a very nearby one, extraordinarily pretty thing. That's the Horsehead Nebula here in the back. You have uh, a stellar nursery here that's uh, turning out new stars. And these new stars affect the material around it, affect the gases out of which they uh, essentially form. We already passed the Horset Nebula. Uh, at this point, we're already a few thousand light years, a couple thousand light years away from Earth. Coming up next is actually another stellar nursery. That's uh, the Rosette Nebula. It's very pretty. It tells you astronomers are romantic. As we call it after a rose, but there's some 10,000 stars in here that light up the gases around it again in red. Uh, that's light that hydrogen likes to give off. Now here's another beast that looks uh, from afar looks similar. It actually uh, isn't. This is a supernova remnant, so-called Crab uh, Nebula. And watch, there's something blinking in the middle here. See that? That's a, uh, actually a pulsar that's right in the middle. Pulsars are very fast, rapidly spitting neutron stars. Um, and we had to slow it down a little bit. In reality, it actually spins around its own axis uh, 30 times a second. That's not bad, considering that it's a little bit, uh, it's about the size of Hamilton, okay? It's ha one and a half times the mass of the sun, but somehow it manages to spin around itself 30 times a second. It's really extraordinarily fast. I mean, you don't want to do this with Hamilton, try to turn it over <coughs> 30 times a second. Um, now, what I did so far is, you know, it was all based on a catalog uh, collected by the Hipparchus satellite. It was about 200,000 stars. Well, all the exactly correct positions, the, we had the correct luminosities for all the stars, we had the correct colors for all the stars, which on the screen is a little hard to uh, discern, but some of them are more reddish than others, others are more blue, it has much to do with their mass and mostly the surface temperature uh, of them. But all of the data, everything I showed you, um, was the real deal. It was the correct images, correct locations. Um, so just for a few seconds, excuse me that I won't continue with such scientific rigor, um, because one thing nobody's ever done is to see the Milky Way from top. Okay. So we don't know what the Milky Way really does look like from the top. We have some ideas. Um, we know that it has some spiral arms. We also know that our sun is about 24,000 light years away from the center. So, you know, we sit in an arm sort of fairly boringly out here. Um, with 24,000 light years to go to get to the center of the Milky Way. And what we did, we take, uh, did take a surrogate galaxy that actually had the correct number of spiral arms and sort of lined up the spiral arms at the correct location. So it's not, you know, completely made up, but of course no human has or ever will see, um, you know, the Milky Way from top. So the field of view here uh, is almost 100,000 light years across. So you can imagine you would have to fly 100,000 light years away from here, ready to get this sort of angle <laughs> at the Milky Way. I mean, it would be great to do it, but what a boring journey that would be um, to get there. All right. <clears throat> well, now we're out of here, and we sort of see our own galaxy. That's great. Um, but what's up with all the dots? Are there like interstellar stars? 
No, every single dot now actually is an individual galaxy. So our galaxy hosts about 100 billion stars. 100 billion, so you know, one and 11 zeros. Now, all of these guys are, you know, already appear to look quite smaller. In fact, that's true. There's uh, tens of small galaxies around our own galaxy. They're small, so we call them dwarf galaxies, okay? So some of them have, um, you know, the bigger ones have a billion stars. Um, then we started discovering, uh, sort of 10 years ago, we started discovering more and more that only had about 100,000 stars in them, or a million stars. And now, uh, actually in the last year or two, we find new galaxies right up against our nose. I mean, literally just that are still missing in this picture. There's more little galaxies around. Some as small that they only contain 200 stars. Okay, we still call them galaxies. It's an assembly of stars, but very small ones. And the remarkable thing is, even very up close to us, we're still discovering them today. Okay, I mean, so astronomy is great that way. So you know, a lot of things that I learned 10 years ago are just wrong now. You know. Um, so it's fun to be in it because you can help, you know, find stuff out, um, and you know that's half the fun of it. All right, but let's, you know, this is just a measly hundred thousand light years across. Let's keep going. Um, so here, actually, there's a two Magellanic cloud. So if you go to Brazil or something, you can actually see them on the night sky. There's a large and small Magellanic cloud, more little dwarf galaxies. Um, <clears throat> let's head over to our sister galaxy, Andromeda. So a slightly bit larger than the Milky Way. There's a few more stars. That's the triangulum. There's some uh, massive star forming region in here that we're going to fly through. Again, Andromeda has the same issue. It's got little dwarf galaxies that sort of cluster, like to hang out around the big one. Okay, see a bunch more. And it's also around Andromeda where we keep discovering new galaxies. <clears throat> you know, Andromeda is fun. Uh, it's, it's actually a galaxy you can see with your naked eye when you have a really a perfectly dark night. You can see a very faint, hazy spot. Usually, you know, it's quite a bit ways off from Cassiopeia, but uh, you can sort of train yourself to find it. It's a little hazy spot, and what's so remarkable about that is that that galaxy, the light traveled two million years to get to you, and your, your eye actually manages to still detect that light. Sure, you had 200 billion stars, okay? <laughs> and you, all you see is a little fuzzy spot. But nevertheless, it, it traveled for two million years before it hit your eye. And you get to do that every day if you're an astronomer. Um, anyhow, um, but now we just flew out. And the, uh, Andromeda you know, is two million light years away. Um, <clears throat> but now we zoomed out and we see, still see a lot of uh, spots, some sort of roundish things over here, more of a filamentary structure, a sheet-like thing. Uh, again, it's again all galaxies. So this particular part here is actually the Virgo cluster. The whole region you refer to as the Virgo supercluster. As we're uh, flying around here, we pasted in the correct images, the correct positions again of all the galaxies in our nearby universe um, to show this. Now the, this galaxy cluster is amazing. You have some 2,000 galaxies all going around each other. Okay. Um, it's the whole thing itself is already uh, 10 million light years across. Okay, what we had to do for this movie, sorry for cheating again, um, we in fact made the galaxies 10 times larger than they really are. And so this way it allows you to still see some of the features of the galaxies, and, but we're hiding a little bit the fact that space, you know, has a lot of space. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of space between galaxies. Um, that's the issue. Now we're actually just falling into this big cluster of galaxies where the biggest galaxy is right in the center of this galaxy cluster. It's called M87 and it has a black hole in the center. A few times, a few billion solar masses worth of black hole. You saw this little thing sticking out. It was actually a jet. It was material that where the black hole blows out material at 99% the speed of light. And you think, that's a black hole. It's got to swallow everything. But yeah, it swallows a lot. Uh, but in the process, it also accelerates a, a small amount of material that it can fling out very close to the speed of light. That's what we get to see. Now we're just sort of flying backwards. And you, you get an appreciation for sort of the what we would call the larger scale structure of the universe. So that you have clusters of galaxies, sheet-like and filamentary structures, in which all the hundred billion galaxies that we know of sort of arrange of, arrange in. 
<clears throat> I'll show you a little bit more about the large scale structure of the universe in a second. Okay, so more or less, that's where we live. Okay, uh, it's our uh, nearest sort of 100, 100 million light years or so, a little more. Um, about 300 million light years, I think, is roughly what we've covered. <clears throat> okay, it's great. We could do this journey just because we could do this uh, on a computer, um, you know, in such a short time. Works great. Now, <clears throat> so I talked a lot about the galaxy. Now I want to uh, give you a little bit more appreciation of how complicated that is. Because it, what we always do is we just show you these optical images. So we show you what you would see in the visible band, you know, what you see with your naked eye, you use a telescope. That's the type of images that we had in this whole movie, is you know, what galaxies look like. Now, <clears throat> the fortunate thing is that light, you know, even though we use that word for only the visible band, is actually an extraordinarily flexible thing. You can have light uh, with wavelengths of meters, and you can have it um, you know, where the wavelength is actually the scale of an atomic nucleus. So the one would be radio waves, the other one would be more gamma rays. Um, in it. And at, the, you know, at all times, it's actually the same physical phenomenon. So whether it's infrared or x-ray or radio, it's always the same, same physical phenomenon. It's an electromagnetic wave. Um, but as we all know from you know, uh, medical applications, certainly, when you take x-rays or for infrared, it just behaves very differently um, depending how much energy uh, that radiation has. Now, the, here's a sort of a, a collage of what our Milky Way looks like in many, many different uh, wavelengths. So if we could look, you know, have eyes that are responsive uh, to other wave bands, we could see this. So here is the optical version that we already studied. So that would be, this is towards the center of the Milky Way. And you see all the dark clouds are dark, I mean, are cold molecular uh, clouds. It's actually full of dust. It's the dust, you know, so the dust bunnies in the universe. Yeah. You've got sort of dust in there that actually absorbs all the light from the stars. And all this light that comes from the stars in the optical and the UV, it heats the dust. So you've got warm dust bunnies. Now they radiate uh, again that radiation in the infrared. Just like our bodies are radiating quite heavily in this warm room now, um, it all comes out in the infrared radiation. So if I would have night vision goggles, I would still all see you. There I would pick up the infrared uh, light of it. Very similarly, if the optical light gets absorbed by the dust, warms the dust, dust gives it off in infrared, you now see in near infrared, in mid infrared, and in sort of directly in the infrared, you see the things that used to be dark, all of a sudden they light up. So in these, these regions, it's exactly the dark clouds that all of a sudden get bright. Okay. So it's fantastic to have an infrared camera because I can actually see things that in the optical I, I didn't have any knowledge about. They were just a nuisance because they were in the way. Um, <clears throat> similarly, if you look uh, even in the x-rays, uh, the galaxy is full of x-ray emitting gas. Uh, actually, we call it plasma at this point. I mean, it's so hot that like, you know, in a hydrogen atom, you just have a proton and an electron going around it. Uh, in a plasma, it's so hot that the electron actually can't hold on to the proton, and the protons and the electrons move separately. And so as hot plasmas like this, they can have millions of degrees. Um, you can find all over uh, the plane of the galaxy even, uh, emitting in the x-rays. And so things you know, like supernova remnants are particularly bright in there, and uh, particular events uh, can be particularly bright there. So we, I just ordered it here from the most energetic, gamma ray, x-ray, optical down to the least energetic radiation where you just have radio uh, emission. Literally the same radio that you use, sort of the long wa longest wave bands, same radio that your cell phones use or that you use uh, for television. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and so you can, you know, just qualitatively look, um, all the pictures look very different. And this is uh, the beauty for us that they all look so different, we actually manage to extract very different information from the different wave bands. Instead of studying any given object in the universe, in many, as many wave bands as possible, gives you, you know, the most amount of information you can possibly hope for. And there are truly remarkable things. I mean, we know how many heavy elements there are in the sun. Okay? It's about 2% of the mass of the sun is not hydrogen or helium. Okay? It's actually 70, uh, you know, 75% of the sun is just hydrogen. 
is actually most, most of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen, you know, including the atoms that we have in our body that make the water, the H2O. All that hydrogen was made three minutes, within three minutes of the Big Bang. Okay? But it's all hydrogen. And sort of slowly over time, massive stars produce other elements like carbon and oxygen. And, but you, know, you wonder how in the world do we know that the sun has 2% of heavy elements. I mean, we can't go there. We can't like scoop it up. We can't like throw a laboratory in. Um, and it's all about studying the properties of light emitted by the sun. So the certain uh, elements have particular uh, wave bands that they like to absorb or to emit. In the sun, it's mostly absorption. And so by studying the detailed um, parts of light that the atmosphere of the sun, we call it the photosphere, likes to absorb, can we tell how many of those different elements are in there? And from that, we can study many tens of elements in the sun. We didn't have to get up from our chair. You know? So it's this beautiful thing that, we, uh, you know, that physics was kind to us, that <clears throat> really just sitting on Earth uh, or you know, putting a satellite around Earth, we actually can look out at the universe and tell what things are made of, how heavy they are, um, and you know, really from afar learn many of the physical intrinsic properties of them. Okay, it's great to be an astronomer. Actually, it's even better to be an astronomer five billion years from now. Um, okay, because this is the Milky Way. That's the Andromeda Galaxy. As so our sun was roughly here. So if you imagine five billion years from now, that's what's gonna happen. We and Andromeda will collide. At that time, if you go out uh, you know, at night, you get to see 200 billion stars right in front of you. It's great, you know, it just, uh, astronomy made easy, okay? Uh, of course, the nights are not as dark anymore. Our sun is already dead. There's a few downsides to that scenario. Uh, but, but for an astronomer, it would be a, a truly wonderful time to be around. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's sort of, you know, this all will sort of happen on a 10 billion year uh, time scale. And you know, it, it's still sort of a reminder that all these things in the universe are sort of evolving and constantly changing. You're building new galaxies by smashing older ones and smaller ones together. You make bigger ones. And the, the whole picture of the universe, it, it never was steady. Things have constantly been evolving. It's always just a question of, are you looking at the right sort of time scale? Okay, over a year, well, there's not much going on. Okay, things are not moving very rapidly. But over a, a few tens of millions of years, there's new stars being born here and new stars being born here. Some blow up in supernovae. So at, uh, at very different time scales, you get different impression of how rapidly the universe is evolving. <clears throat> and a uh, you know, particular way where we can bring this home very easily is when we look at the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. I just love this image. So there's a shuttle down here. That's the actual space telescope. This is a human being. You call them astronauts if they're from America. Um, they uh, just, you know, I've, I'm always just blown away at the scale of this, um, of how big this thing really is. Um, of course, it's, um, I'm, I'm afraid you might have read in the news it's broken. Um, so we're a little bit in trouble. It used to know how to take the data and send it down to Earth. Right now, it doesn't know how to send the data anymore, which is a little bit of a pity. As one of my colleagues, in fact, was observing at the same time, so we think he broke it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what his credit limit is, but uh, he's going to be in trouble. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, fortunately, they do have a backup channel uh, on it. The backup channel, of course, hasn't been switched on since 1989. Um, good luck, uh, you say. And so the pity is uh, there was to be a servicing mission actually this month, in just 10 days. Uh, they were supposed to go and exchange some of the other broken instruments uh, that it had already. And we're all very much looking forward to it because they were actually much better instruments than the old ones that we had on there. Um, and with this new glitch, we have to wait at least till April next year uh, for this to happen. The astronaut, astronauts have to retrain. Also, uh, you know, it's even a larger workload now that they have to do, and, and there's a lot of spacewalks already to get this accomplished. So uh, there was some good luck uh, for this. But the remarkable thing about this instrument is that they had a panel um, some 10, 15 years ago, I guess, already where, <clears throat> so they got a whole group together, the director of the, um, 
uh, Telescope Institute, he actually had some time set aside for him. You know, so he, because he gets to be director, he has a small fraction of the total observing time. And uh, he asked his colleagues, you know, what should I do with this time? Like, you know, I've got, you know, we could spend, you know, many, many hours observing something. And so most people sort of came in and said, you know, everybody was pushing their own, you know, line of research. They said, oh, yeah, let's do this, and, let, you know, let's look at global clusters, let's look at other galaxies, let's look at... And uh, so nobody could really agree. But then somebody was uh, smart enough to say, well, wait, let's take the darkest spot we can find on the sky and then stare at it as long as we possibly can. And that's what everybody could agree on. Okay. <laughs> um, and it, it sounds a bit silly sort of in, in hindsight, but it produced these remarkable images of what were first known as the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You know, very deep, sort of, uh, long, uh, staring long at it. And um, there was a sort of a second version, a better camera was in place. They did the whole exercise again because the first time it was already so successful. In the meantime, it's of larger patches, one in the north and one in the south. And this is, in fact, one of them. And what this led to is, you know, this really was picked as a, a spot where people had known only one or two galaxies in the entire field. You know, they had no idea, you know, uh, what's out there. And once, you know, Hubble stared for it uh, for a long enough time, literally thousands and thousands of objects were, you could possibly start to see. And many of these uh, galaxies that you find are actually, uh, the light from them traveled many billions of years. Some of them 10, 11 billion years to get to others. Others, you know, it only took like 4 billion years. Okay, so we're fairly close. Uh, but um, what, what we've been learning from studying images like this is that in the past, uh, galaxies tended to be smaller, and many of them tended to look like train wrecks. Okay? We've got uh, different types of uh, galaxies. It's a whole zoo. We've got really fat ones, and we've got long and skinny ones, and uh, we've got you know, all, all sorts of types. Um, but there's also one class of galaxy we always call irregular galaxies. All it means is, well, it didn't look flat, and it didn't look round, so call it irregular. Um, and so we, we started realizing, as, as you stare at these images, many of the galaxies that you find very early on, or that are very far away, um, they tended to be highly disturbed. And um, you know, that tells you about that many of these galaxies are probably in the process of interacting and falling in uh, together. And so you take small galaxies merging, falling together, and that this was a more common thing in the past than it is today. Okay. We saw it for Andromeda and the Milky Way. It's going to happen in a few billion years. Yep. But in the past, the time scale was much more rapid. So every billion years or so, galaxies kept falling into each other. Um, but you know, that's sort of, sort of an integral part of how galaxies sort of build up. Um, so that's a very tiny little patch of the sky where you look back and just count um, the galaxies that you can see and you record the colors. And with cosmology, it's really, I shouldn't even say that. What usually happens is you go through an image like this, and then you look for the reddest spot you can possibly find. Okay? So you find something where you barely, barely see anything. And then if it's really, really red, then my colleagues like jump up and down. Okay? This is very exciting because uh, we actually can tell that things, the faster they move away from us, the further away they are. The universe is expanding. And the way it's expanding is if a galaxy is twice as far away from us, its relative velocity to us is twice as fast. Okay? Well, what that means is it actually shifts the light, redshifts, just like the sonic, um, you know, sort of sound waves are shifted. You know this from the ambulance. You have an ambulance that comes towards you. It goes, wee, wee, wee. And then it goes away from you. It goes, wee, wee, wee. It's really loud. <coughs> that's why I never became a singer. Uh, but these, um, you know, that's exactly the same effect. So things that move away from you, light be uh, gets to a longer wavelength. So the light is redshifted. So it goes to lesser energy. Red light has less energy than blue light. Um, and so when you see a really, really red galaxy, it means it's moving very rapidly away from you, which then typically means that it's really far away from you. And so this way, this is how you find the farthest galaxies ever found. And some of them now, in fact, um, we know light traveled for them for 12.8 billion years to get to us. Okay, so that's the farthest galaxies we've ever seen. And it's great. They, not, they don't look very great, so I don't have a special picture for you because it's a red dot. 
in the, the red, you know, you barely can see the red. Okay, so it's not as spectacular as you might think. Um, but the, it is remarkable what, what it actually entails. That for 12.8 billion years, that light just kept going straight until it uh, finally hit us. Okay, so what we did here is we looked at a very small patch, uh, patch of the sky, as sensitive as possible. We can sort of do an, uh, another uh, thing where we look at a much larger fraction of the sky and try to count all the galaxies that we can sort of do. This is from a particular survey called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's actually a very small thing. It's only a telescope that has a mirror this size. Uh, no big deal. That the only thing what it did is it, for years, every night it went out and found galaxies and measured how far away they are. And so now here we just painted in little dots for every single galaxy that that survey found. This in fact is actually old data. By now they uh, have much, much wider coverage. So because you see, you know, there's some wedges and there's some parts of the universe where there's no galaxies, okay? There's a lot of galaxies there. It's just the telescope hadn't looked in that region yet, okay? So if you see empty spaces sort of in between, um, they not really empty of galaxies. Okay, now we're just flying back to the Milky Way, sort of seeing ourselves from the outside. And so the, we're back to roughly the local uh, Virgo supercluster here that we already looked at earlier. Okay, so there's, uh, you know, tens uh, of millions of galaxies is what we can catalog today already. With, you know, all you need, a small telescope, keep looking. Um, and unfortunately, you have a computer that, you know, writes down the numbers where you found them. Uh, otherwise, it'd be a lot of work. And of course, this type of uh, project we want to continue, and we're actually uh, involved in building a much larger system like this, where you take a really big telescope, eight meter in diameter, you're gonna go and measure, you take a camera, just like your digital camera, well, not quite, with three gigapixels, okay? So that's uh, 300 of your best digital camera you can have. The camera will have a size like this, uh, you know, just where the, all the CCDs are that record the light. And then uh, you take 10 second or so exposures, which means that you take a few, um, about almost 20 terabytes of data a night. It's just for the geeks for us, okay? <laughs> It's just exciting, okay. <laughs> right, it's a hundred hard drives. You know, anyway. <clears throat> it's a lot of work, that's what that is. Uh, yeah, 30 petabytes of data over 10 years lifetime. Uh, so it'll be just enormous. The beautiful thing about this is, for all of you, you can be astronomers at home because all the data will be public and you know, there's so much data that all the professional astronomers, I don't think, there's a few thousand of us in the world, you know, so we're not gonna get to half of this. Uh, so. I think it'll be actually a very exciting era where you, you'll find a lot of discoveries being made um, by folks that you know, um, can do this from home. Okay, that's just a little bit of excitement. Now we've sort of, you know, got our heads to sort of think big, so big scales, hundreds of millions of light years across. Uh, so I want to switch gears a little bit and go to talk a little bit about these baby pictures of the universe. So <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the 60s, Two folks at Bell Laboratories, they were playing with this antenna. So all of the stuff, uh, stuff, of course, was sort of after the Second World War. People realized radar technology, very useful, military applications, you know, it's great. Um, and so as they tried to sort of improve on these technologies that they uh, were doing there, they just didn't know what's wrong with their machine. Um, they could point this thing anywhere they wanted it would always have some noise. They always had a measurement. They always found there is a signal, okay? Finally, when they turned the thing to the ground, it was better, much less signal, okay? But as, see, as soon as they turned it to the sky, there was always some signal of radio waves that they'd uh, be observing. So they you know, they have beautiful anecdotal stories about them sort of cleaning out um, pigeon remains, I guess is the polite way of saying that. Uh, where they sort of in there brooming out uh, the dirt and stuff, but they just couldn't get rid of it. So they looked at the experiment again, but eventually realized that this was really radiation that uh, came uh, from all directions on the sky. It was exactly the same signal, and it doesn't matter where, which way you look. And this is the one thing that's still absolutely remarkable about this. This is radiation where, that has been traveling literally for 13.7 billion years straight before it hits your detector, okay? Now, if you look over in that direction, okay, that light was traveling 13.7 billion years before it hit your detector. Well, you look at, over in this direction, it took 13.7 million years to hit your detector. Well, how in the world did these two places know to have exactly the same signal? 
they could have never talked to each other, right? Over the age of the universe, the signal could have made it from over there to us, and the signal could have made it from there to us. But the two of them could have never talked to each other. And that's what's remarkable about it. So it tells us something very fundamental about the very early universe, that in fact, it was extraordinarily similar in all directions. It was extraordinarily, uh, you know, same conditions. So over this very wide range of, you know, sort of parts of space, the universe back then had the same temperature. Okay, the temperature it has, uh, had, in fact, when this originated, was a few thousand degrees Kelvin. You know, not uh, actually a little bit less uh, cold than the surface of the sun. This is roughly when the, this radiation originated. Today, it's three Kelvin. Okay, three above absolute zero. And it's very cold. And that all that comes from is that the universe, since then, expanded so much that the typical distance between galaxies, in fact, is now 1,100 times larger than it would have been back then. I use this funny measure. There were no galaxies back then. Okay, so you might have caught uh, my thing. But the logic is actually still true. A typical distance now, if you follow it back in time, it would have been 1,100 times smaller at the time this radiation originated. And it literally, the image of it looks like this. Very boring, okay? <laughs> so it's the same from all directions. And so in the old days, that's really all you sort of could tell. Um, then, um, actually, a Nobel Prize was awarded a couple of years ago to John Mather and George Smoot that sort of were um, the key players putting together this um, satellite that in the early 90s flew and in sort of mid-90s reported the results. Um, and they uh, also could measure this sort of dipole, this radiation. In fact, all that has to do is, again, the same Doppler effect. It's actually us moving with respect to this radiation. So if we move in one particular direction, it actually looks a little bit warmer in the direction that we're moving uh, compared to the direction we're moving away from. Um, this is actually wonderful because we, now we have a measurement of how fast we're moving with respect to, to sort of most of the universe if you want. And that, uh, that speed is actually pretty awesome. It's about 600 kilometers a second. It's nice. So to California, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds would have been much easier than the flight I actually did take. Um, and so, yeah, but that's sort of the speed, you know, the sun and earth, everything together, uh, local uh, versus most of the universe that you can measure. Now, <clears throat> but this was still not the biggest discovery that came from the cosmic microwave background. Um, the way you want to think about this, where it originates, is the universe was really dense at, uh, early on, and so all the radiation, in fact, always got stuck because it saw electrons. When elect uh, radiation sees an electron, it sort of scatters off the electron, very much like light that sort of scatters around in the clouds above you. And at the end, all you get to see is the surface of the cloud. You don't get to see inside the cloud. All you see is the light that sort of comes out of the surface of the cloud and eventually makes it to your eye. But before that, sort of inside the cloud, you have all this fog where radiation just scatters around. Okay, and the, of course, in the clouds here, it's actually the water uh, vapor that the light sort of scatters off of. In the early universe, it was just electrons. But it's the, very much the same concept. So what we're seeing from this cosmic microwave background essentially is this lower surface of the cloud. And when we do this now with yet another new satellite that's still taking data and look at the maps it would produce, they look like this. Okay, so we heavily massage this, okay? First of all, we only show um, this sort of a stretch where you see one part in a thousand, uh, sorry, one part in a hundred thousand are sort of high points and low points, okay? They are one part in a hundred thousand even brighter or one part in a hundred thousand dimmer of the overall signal tiny, tiny little extra fluctuations. And on top of it, we took out the dipole, so this motion of us versus that radiation, and we also took out what the galaxy looks like uh, in the middle. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's actually hard to get across, but for us, this was really uh, just a, an amazing uh, discovery because what it tells you is that the universe, when it was 400,000 years old, it was not exactly homogeneous. I mean, it was almost perfectly homogeneous, but it had very slight perturbations. Some regions were slightly denser than others. And that is really good. Because if it wouldn't have been, if there are no regions that would be a little bit denser, 
we could not be here. Okay. And since we know we're here, you know, we're, we're happy to find that in fact, in the early universe, you had regions that were slightly denser than the rest, because that, what that means is that gravity now can hold on to these slightly denser regions, and gravity can continue to pull on it, continue to make it pull it together more and more, make it denser and denser, and eventually be able to make galaxies and stars uh, inside of it. And so that's how Stephen Hawking actually um, you know, was all excited about this halo, the biggest discovery of uh, mankind. You know, there's so many discoveries, but you know, nice exaggeration. Somehow, however, he managed to get his tribute into this map. So I'll now play something with your mind, and it'll be interesting about your mind. You look at this, here are his initials, S, H, okay? <laughs> so you'll, uh, every single time, I'll swear to you, every single time you look at this map, you'll always find this again, okay? So uh, somehow I've, for life, altered your brains. Sorry, you didn't sign a wafer or... <laughs> but it's amazing how this works, that your perception in your mind really goes for this. It's, so, yeah, I never failed to look for it uh, in this. But now, so there's very detailed uh, studies of this cosmic microwave background. We now um, have a very complete, uh, perhaps a little ugly picture of what the actual universe is all made of. I don't fully have time to go through all of this today, but we know it's about 13.7 billion years old. Um, hydrogen and helium in fact, are only about 70% of the total matter content, but in fact only make out about 4% of the total energy content in our universe today. 25% um, of the total energy density is in fact what's all in matter. So some of it, a small fraction of it is atoms. Most of it is something we call dark matter. Um, and we see dark matter all over the place. So we have many ways of convincing ourselves it's really there, it's not just a fluke. Um, and even in this data, we can tell quite easily that it must be there. It's just a form of matter that doesn't scatter light or give off light, but it still gravitates like everything else. Um, universe is full of it, um, and we're actually very thankful uh, that it's there. Not only does it hold the galaxies together, in all our modern understanding, without dark matter again, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so, you know, you like it. Um, helps you out. The densest region back then was really just 0.1% of the mean density. So that just means it really is exactly the same everywhere, just a tiny little fluctuation. But it was so long ago that over time, these small deviations grew into uh, the structures that we see today. And the beauty of that is that the level of the fluctuations that we see and the amount of time that we know it had to become galaxies perfectly fit together. Okay? Could have been the other thing that we actually see the fluctuations, but they a hundred times too small than what we expected. You know, that would have told us that we done we just don't understand gravity, or we don't know how old the universe really is. But no, it, the picture actually hangs together at this level of the fluctuations. It's actually very uh, well and uh, natural to understand why there are galaxies today. So that's great. Okay, so now we've got. We know what the universe looked like 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Well, you know, let's figure out what happens next. And so that's where sort of the physics comes in and sort of a lot of the things I've been working on and many of my colleagues uh, were all uh, highly focused on. And so the way this goes is um, we've got the initial conditions. Now we say for the physics, all we need is we have to worry about how gravity moves the dark matter and the uh, baryonic, sort of the atoms. Um, so the, we have to understand gravity. We have to understand how fluids move. Then we actually have to also know something about chemistry. So we also follow how the hydrogen and helium in the early universe eventually starts making its first molecules. Uh, it's a bit tricky. And let me also tell you, it's actually very easy because in the Big Bang, only hydrogen and helium are made. There was a tiny little bit of deuterium and lithium, sort of small uh, things, but mostly just hydrogen and helium. Helium is a noble gas, right? And you know when you inhale it, you talk funny, right? And you sort of have that in, in a balloon, you know, they sort of rise up. But helium doesn't like to react. It, that's why it's so extraordinarily safe to do this. And you give the balloon to your child and you don't worry about it. Helium does not like to react. And that's what makes chemistry for us even simpler. So now we only have the hydrogen left that actually essentially does anything. And so that makes, uh, you know, that makes it initially relatively easy. Now we have to worry about radiation. So if, if gas gives off radiation, it essentially um, 
you know, it makes a big mistake because it gives off energy. It, all that energy comes from its own internal pressure or, you know, the force it has to withstand gravity. Well, if it gives off that energy, gravity will win, right? And that's a mistake that our sun, in some sense, or is a battle that our sun will also lose. Right now, what it's doing is it's fighting gravity, right? And it's got a good trick because it's got nuclear fusion going on in the very center of the sun. So it can use all this extra energy, this nuclear energy, right? Uh, e equals mc squared, and c squared is really big. So it uses a little bit of mass, creates an enormous amount of energy. And this way, it sort of manages to hang out for about 10 billion years. But then it runs out of fuel. And then it's going to lose again because gravity is going to pull it together. And the biggest mistake it actually makes in this whole process is that it shines, off, shines light. This light is fantastic for us. Life wouldn't be here without it, uh, all of this. Uh, but for the sun, you know, ultimately, that's the bad news. Uh, it, however, this whole process of giving off radiation, essentially, that always comes from the gravitational energy, is what allows stars to form. So as things contract, the gas would tend to heat up. But by giving off radiation, the gas can cool down again, have a smaller pressure force, and eventually gravity can pull it all together to make stars. This is sort of the, one of the key principles how you, you are able to make stars. Um, <clears throat> trouble just is, you know, the only trouble with this whole thing is that stars are tiny. So our sun is a trillion times smaller than the Milky Way. So to understand how the whole sun formed, you actually want to follow all the gas, how it contracts from an enormously large region to become this tiny little thing that's very, very dense. And for this, we um, uh, use particular numerical uh, techniques where I don't, I just show the, off the geeky pictures, um, where we solve all these partial, uh, partial differential equations that, in fact, um, follow gravity and hydrodynamics and such. And we do this in order to sort of answer these questions about these, this would be an object, one of the very first objects that forms in the universe at about a million times the mass of the sun. And then in its very center, we find gas of about a thousand times the mass of our sun. That's cold. And it just sits there. And what we didn't know for 30 years is, will it um, next make a cluster of stars, perhaps like you know, globular clusters we see in our own Milky Way? Or is the more natural outcome, in fact, that it will form a black hole? That's exactly what a black hole looks like. <laughs> exactly. It's an artist's conception, of course. Uh, <clears throat> that would be nice to really take a picture of this. But so, you know, we had this fundamental question. I mean, we couldn't even say that, OK? We knew that, all right, there's some gas, and it can form molecules, and the molecules will go off radiation, and then it can collapse. But what's going to come out? And it's just something you cannot do on a piece of paper. You can do this uh, with a with a supercomputer, but you just can't do it on a piece of paper. And that was sort of, you know, that is what's driving many of the breakthroughs we have in this kind of science. So let, let me show you an animation here where the lighter the color, the higher the density. And this is sort of an evolution in time. This, we only visualize the hydrogen and the helium gas. Uh, in here, it's about 3,000 light years across. And you see all these little objects forming. They coalesce. Gravity drives everything here. Gravity puts it all together makes these little fellows all fall together to build one larger one, only about a million times the mass of the sun. Um, looks a little psychedelic, uh, but is all this turbulence is all driven by the uh, gravitational infall of these different clumps. Now we're in fact flying in towards one of them, this particular region within which uh, this first star is formed, and we keep zooming in, keep zooming in. So every contour here is sort of a higher and higher density level. We're now going down to about the scale, uh, not quite yet, so down here is about the scale of the solar system, where, in fact, what you see is sort of a dense little one solar mass protostar that sits in the center and sort of an elongated sort of disky shape around it. Okay, this is a little bit how our sun formed. I mean, so we, when we had the sun, we made a disk around it. There was a lot of dirt in the disk, dust, and also water ices. Those then broke up and made a whole bunch of planets, including ours. But uh, for this very first star, this primordial case, there was no dust. There were no ices. So you weren't able to make planets around it. All right. Well, I skipped. I mean, I cheated again. I keep cheating today. Uh, so we skipped three million years. Of course, the star actually lived for three million years. Here, what we did is, oh, let's say it explodes. Okay. So it just went straight to supernova from being formed. 
but that's uh, still an accurate calculation of actually what the supernova would look like from one of, uh, one of these stars. Because what we found is that you make massive stars as the very first thing, somewhere between 30 to 300 solar masses, and uh, they will, their supernova will start enriching the medium around it, meaning they will put out carbon oxygen, and in fact, it literally means atoms in your body used to do this. Okay? It's not just some random atom somewhere out in space. Atoms in your body participated. Every single one of you, I will take a bet on this, uh, was part of this. Okay? <clears throat> and we can go through the numbers later if you'd like, but it's a very, it's a very good bet in my favor. Um, you know. What can I say? Anyway, so it used to be that uh, for three, you know, we had to skip because we couldn't do the, the difficult problem of when the star sh uh, starts to shine, all its radiation will impact what it does around it. And we couldn't do, we didn't have the numerical algorithms to actually solve this problem until recently, where we finally overcame uh, this. It took me a long time to work on this. So let me just walk you. So here you have, a, have this star, same story, but we are further out. And you now see all the radiation traveling out, and it heats up the material around it. All the blue stuff is about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Here it just went supernova. Uh, it has a profound impact, in fact, on the surrounding of these early stars. So this little shell you see moving out was actually gas just around the star that's now being expelled. And as it gets all these little corrugations here, it's the heavy elements from the supernova that are being blown out that are mixing into the shell that's running out. Okay? Again, parts of our body used to do this sort of thing, uh, strangely enough. Um, this is not just imaginary on the computer. We actually see this in the nearby universe. There's a particular example I like. This star is about 300,000 times the luminosity of our sun, and it's evaporating all these gases around it. Uh, I like this one because I think I live here. Uh, this is the California Nebula. That's, a, I, that's where I would pinpoint the Bay Area. <clears throat> Um, but you know, that's exactly what we see in our own galaxy too. But when we do this on a supercomputer, we can actually recreate those events of how they happened 12 billion years ago. Um, next event is just that the, the thing goes supernova. Um, that's a very nice uh, example, Cass, uh, Cassiopeia A. Uh, this is in sort of more uh, ultraviolet and optical, and this is the X-ray uh, emission of it that we observe. And <clears throat> You know, it's profound parts because, again, the atoms that come out of here that were made in these massive stars all the way up to iron, uh, these elements are in us. And so we really went through this whole process. So let me, in the interest of time, skip this. It's a little esoteric. It's about black holes, but black holes are cool. Um, okay. So... <clears throat> All right, so we made one star. Now let's just see like, what happens when we let things uh, keep going. So here is the case where we actually look further out, 20,000 light years across. This is still the first few hundred million years of the universe. And now every single event that you see here is actually an individual star that first ionizes the region, so it's, it's radiation. And then this purplish uh, color are, in fact, the heavy elements that the supernovae are fl uh, flinging out. So it's these different. Uh, regions here where we have heavy elements from all these massive stars that like to mix and that gravity then pulls back together uh, to make new galaxies after this. A key thing to keep in mind is 10,000 patches like this one are required to make our Milky Way. Okay? But there is 100 billion galaxies you know, of order the mass of our Milky Way. There's a lot of these patches in the universe. Okay? So we're always just focusing on a tiny little region currently because that's all we can fit on current day computers with this level of detail. So the galaxies that come out then uh, look a little bit like this. So that's an attempt of an early work we have of what the very first galaxies might look like. Uh, and it's sort of the goal we continue to improve on to make bigger and bigger galaxies. So these are the locations of where all the stars had formed. Uh, blue is the hot gas. Red is sort of cooler material. Um, how they look like. This is one of them. And like I said, there's already 10,000 of these that will make up our own Milky Way. And so there's an enormous number of them. Um, so obviously, we'll have a little bit more work to do uh, to learn more about them. Um, <clears throat> let me just sort of make uh, I have two more slides quickly. So the one is you know, just to talk a little bit about how do we discover things, and how, how do we things, and how does supercomputing fit it in. The second will be uh, to take the whole uh, thing a bit more personal. 
when we have sort of a timeline of the universe, sort of we would live up here, that's our era, the era of galaxies, uh, we have sort of a timeline way back in the very first split second of the universe, um, we are learning a lot about particle physics of how sort of the fundamental forces that sort of govern of what types of particles we have um, actually govern how the whole universe evolves as a whole. So here's sort of the area of nuclear synthesis where hydrogen and helium are being formed and also trace elements of deuterium and lithium. Um, that's just the first few minutes. Now, the era I've been talking about mostly today is sort of the first billion years of the universe where in fact we hardly have any observations from telescopes, okay? Close to us, we just use the Hubble Space Telescope or this was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope or many of the others and we can just probe all the nearby galaxies and things that happen inside of them. But for things that are even further back in the past, we currently don't have good enough telescopes to actually get a direct signal from that and that's why we call this uh, era still the dark ages. Um, and it's these dark ages where you have the first stars and the first galaxies. They tend to be small and the small things are hard to find when they're this far away. And so currently it's really supercomputers um, that allow us to sort of probe this era, building on the initial conditions that we see here, just predicting the past if you want, and perhaps also predicting future observations, uh, which future observations would see. So within you know, 2003, National Geographic put our work on the cover and they called it Discovering the First Galaxies. It, you know, I was a little bit uh, taken aback uh, at first because the, I mean, first of all, it was the first time I ever put a, uh, anything that's not a photograph on the front of the cover. You know, that was great. Um, actually, before there were photographs, they had illustrations. It's an old magazine, so they used to have non-photographs, but it, they never had any computer-generated image on it. But it, you know, it seemed like a big um, of an overstatement, but it, you know, now I actually start to realize, yeah, it's kind of true. It's, it's only on the computer can we now discover what the first galaxies might have looked like. Um, and it's sort of another way of getting at you know, the whole story of the universe, where for the very early times you use particle accelerators, and you'll have this exciting lecture in February to learn about the LHC, Large Hadron Collider in, in Geneva. There you'll learn a lot about why you would uh, put $10 billion at work to, put a, to understand of what particles exist and how they shape uh, the early stages of the universe. Um, and we're sort of doing the same with the supercomputers in the, in the middle. Okay, now let's get personal. Okay, first of you, uh, first of all, you're old. Okay, uh, so I always tell my students no excuses because you're really old. Uh, much of you is 13.7 billion years old, in fact. So all the hydrogen in your body, protons, have been around for 13.7 billion years. They don't age, they're still the same like they were, very chipper little fellas. Uh, exactly the same charge, you know, there's no wear and tear on these guys. Uh, so that's good to know. Uh, practically nothing of you is younger than 4.5 billion years. Okay, so. Ah, oh, but you know, I've got something, no. Nope. Uh, pretty much all atoms in your body are older than 4.5 billion years. So your average age you know, is probably around 8 billion years. So if next time somebody asks you how old are you and you want to avoid the obvious answer, <laughs> I suggest that's a good one uh, to, to pretend uh, to you. I mean, interesting for me, of course, with these early stars is that about sort of the size of a little finger or so of all the atoms in your body, that's what would have participated in making the very first stars. But uh, much more remarkably is perhaps if you sort of take toll of all your atoms in your bottom, you sort of have a poll. We're into polling these days. So you, you, pull, you ask every single atom in your body, oh, where did you come from? Where did you come from? Which stars were you associated with? Um, they would, you would actually get at least 100 million different answers. And so, um, this is quite remarkable and it worked out because you used to be huge. So if you were you know, on a diet like I should be, uh, you're in fact uh, not realizing that you used to be a million light years across. <laughs> okay. So there's you know, two centimeters here or there, it doesn't really make a big difference <laughs> in my opinion. So you used to be huge uh, in that sense. Um, okay, 100 million stars are inside of you, and so this whole history of the universe, you're actually sampling, you know, with the atoms in your body. And so, in some sense, for me, it's a little bit philosophically, you know, if you just think of water waves, um, you drop a stone in the water, and there's information clearly traveling, right? There's sort of a wave that's going out in a circle, and it's clear, it's sort of, it's round, it's always, you know, the center 
of the circle is where you threw in the stone. So there's information that's traveling. But the individual water molecules, they're just going up and down. I mean, there's no water molecule actually traveling over. It's sort of the information's traveling in the medium. That's sort of a water wave. Well, the funny thing for us is since biologists tell us, you know, we're obviously we're always eating, uh, we're constantly replacing the atoms in our body, right? So it's not the same atoms that I was born with that I still have. There's a few probably in my teeth or so that I don't lose as quickly, but most of the atoms, in fact, are moving through my body. And here, that analogy with the wave, it's sort of exactly the same, just opposite, where the information, meaning you, or who you are and who you think you are, it's there, in the medium, if you want, it's just passing through you, okay? So the atoms are sort of going through you over, over your life, but you grow in sort of what you have um, in your mind, you know, that's what sort of exists. So that's perhaps a little philosophical uh, to have in mind if, if you want to have a cocktail later or something, this is the type of thing you want to be contemplating. Um, all right, let me just summarize, uh, say, you know, remarkably that the universe is now not only explored by telescopes or particle accelerators, it's also explored with the use of supercomputers. Um, the, uh, and what, you know, one very clear thing, you know, this is a particular good example, this is this work on the first stars where we could only discover using supercomputers that the first stars indeed formed in isolation, sort of they're lonely, uh, they didn't form in many clusters. They, in fact, uh, were alone and were very massive. So they produced uh, some of the heavy elements already and started this whole process of getting the universe from something very simple to something complex and rich enough that it, in fact, could lead to life and eventually uh, to us. And so cosmologists, in some sense, if you want, are predicting the past, and they're also predicting what the next generation of telescopes uh, will see. And now is really a perfect time. And I say that because the launch of this you know, fantastic new telescopes, where Canada here is involved as well in the James Webb Telescope, um, is still another five years away, which means I still have five years to make my calculations better, okay? So it's not happening today uh, yet, and so, you know, I have five years to improve, but it's not 50 years, okay? So I don't, so it's sort of a perfect time to do this. Um, it's kind of silly to put more funding into this 20 years from now, um, you know. I am not looking for your money. Um, and, but do take this home. Uh, please do take this uh, very personal. The universe is, is really part of all of us. Thanks so much.